When Mockingjay, Part 2, the last Hunger Games movie, was released in 2015, Barack Obama was president. Taylor Swift's original 1989 album was the only version in existence, and Jon Snow was maybe dead on Game of Thrones. Now, eight years after the original cinematic series concluded, and 13 after the release of the final novel, The Hunger Games, The Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes invites us back to the brutal world of Paynum. Its flamboyantly named characters like Claymantia Dovecoat and Palmyra Monty, and of course, all that ritualistic kid killing. Remarkably, Songbirds and Snakes has found a way to make the Hunger Games feel new and sharp. Given that it's been so long, that the books and original movies were well executed to the point that the Hunger Games spurred an entire copycat ya cottage industry. And worn down by the cinematic churn of IP mining, my guard was up. Yet, driven by its two charismatic leads, Tom Blith and Rachel Zegler, sharp writing, and well-executed storytelling, the prequel finds a way to be as thoughtful and agile as the best of the series. Songbirds and Snakes flips everything we know about the games, taking us to where it all started. And Coriolanus Snow's blith introduction to them. Snow eventually becomes the sadistic mastermind who runs the Hunger Games, but he wasn't always this way. This rich and fancy psychopath wasn't always in charge of the Coachella of children killing. Songbirds and Snakes isn't an exoneration of the character, but rather a deep and riveting look at power, the lengths people are willing to go to achieve it. And what it all means in a world we thought we knew so well. Songbirds and Snakes takes place 60 for years before Katniss Everdeen's reaping and first Hunger Games victory. The necessity for the specific? Not quite. Six and a half decade time jump is because Everdeen's second foray into the games is the 75th annual iteration and features the special rule that it will be an all winner season. Doing the math and working backward, 64 years in the past brings us to the 10th annual Hunger Games, which, aside from the name, barely resembles the teenage battle royale we see Everdeen compete in. The main difference between Everdeen's Hunger Games and Songbirds and Snakes' Hunger Games is that everyone's poor and ugly even those in the capital. The capital, which has just quashed the rebellion, is a dusty shell of its glamorous self. Neighboring districts who lost the war are in even worse shape. The games themselves, 20 for children, two from each of the nation's 12 districts, a massive fight to the death, one winner do not have any funding. The busted arena is barely bigger than a high school auditorium. The tributes are neither photogenic nor are they trained. Ratings are poor because, it turns out, no one wants to watch dirty, starving, unathletic, mildly diseased children kill each other. Bad viewership isn't good for the people in charge because the games are needed to stifle a rebellion. The more Paynum's districts are pitted against each other, the less they see that the only way to break free from an authoritarian regime is to unite to overthrow the capital. If the games fail, so does the capital's chokehold on the districts. Desperate to cling to power and to keep the games going, the capital decides to do what any struggling network would do, go for an all-out ratings grab. 